Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Next, I'd like to spend a little time on today, free texting today from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, where I read as follows Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Since the wisdom of God, where, since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased with the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ power of God and wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. This is our text. The first apostles, the early apostles, got their charge from Jesus as he was leaving them to go into heaven. He said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. What? Are you serious, they might have thought? At least a little. Look at what we're facing. The leaders are corrupt. Society is filled with immoral living and bad choices. Faith is grounded in a whole host of pagan deities. They persecuted and killed the very one we worship and serve. They mock and scorn those who trust in him. The chips seem hopelessly stacked against us. How can we fight Rome? How can we fight the Sanhedrin? How can we be a light in a seemingly hopeless pagan world? But moved by the Pentecost Spirit of God, they didn't listen to the naysaying voices, and instead went forward with what Paul writes in our text today, the singular message of Christ crucified. They declared to the world, Jesus is Lord. He died on the cross for me because I am a sinner. He suffered God's punishment for all the wrong that is in me and in all people. He rose from the dead to win my eternal victory and to open up the gates of heaven to all who believe. And the Holy Spirit used that united, simple message to open the eyes of the blind world to see that there is hope, strength, and help that can come when one is in the arms of him who is the Savior. Yes, there was persecution. Yes, threats, hostility, angry words, and hurtful actions were brought forth by the evil one to try and derail the message wherever he could. But the disciples surged forward, and thousands upon thousands were baptized into Christ Churches were planted all over the place, and the love of Jesus brought light to a dark world and hope unto a hopeless society. But notice, please, that the disciples didn't let themselves get bogged down by the ups and downs of a sinful society or in the various political movements that came and went. They didn't campaign for or against the Caesars or go into the marketplace to debate the sexual, social, or moral practices of the day. Sure, eventually they were bold to proclaim the whole counsel of God in these topics as these topics came up within the church and around it. But above all else, when confronting the world, they went forward with the message of the cross. Because they knew that it is not argumentation and philosophy that changes hearts and lives. It is faith. Faith in what had created us, redeemed us, and opened our hearts to follow his will. 
Over the last few days, I have seen many and numerous posts all over social media about the Supreme Court and its decision to redefine marriage. Some of these posts are hostile, filled with venom. Some are supportive, yet berate those who are not. Some are philosophical, some are political, some offer reasoned argumentation, others offer impassioned emotions. The Christian church itself is divided in many ways over this issue, and that of abortion, and guns, and the role of government, and economics, <clears throat> and pornography, and free speech, and art, and capital punishment, and the death penalty, and gambling, gender identification, euthanasia, and so on and so on. Make no mistake about it. As a church body that believes the Bible is the word of God, and it is our calling to follow God's will and God's ways, we certainly stand ready to stay true to him, whether it be popular or not, whether we like it or not. We want his will to be our own because we are his people and trust that he knows what is best for the people he created. When God speaks, we humbly listen and we obey. LCMS President Harrison issued a statement just hours after the decision was rendered by a divided court, sharing some of the fundamental concerns that this decision raises for Christians who both desire to love all people and yet at the same time to stand true to the Word of God and its description of God's will for our lives. There are similar position papers shared by our Commission on Theology and Church Relations on many of the other topics that I mentioned so controversial. All of these are worth reading. But here's the important point I want to make today. Let's not be derailed from the core of who we are by the shifting sands or rolling waves of society. Yes, they are significant. But the tempter loves to get us to spend our time debating things and arguing, judging, and fighting so that he can stop us from sharing what is the foundation of Christianity. The relationship with God that comes through His Son, Jesus Christ. The shouting voices of a changing society will always be there. The difficult decisions and debates will thunder their way through the hallowed halls of justice. But like those first century disciples, as we stand before a world of loneliness and pain, let's be sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. Jesus died and rose again to save us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Jesus came, died, and rose again to save us from sin, death, and the power of the devil. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because you see, in the end, all other roads lead to emptiness to a thirst that is not satisfied, and a hunger that can never find food. And the world will wander to and fro all over the places where they think joy might be found. But you and I know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We know that his open, blood-stained hands of love and grace are the gateway to a relationship with our Maker. We know that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. That's good news that we have to share. And we need to share it every single day with all who will listen because it is that message that leads God's people out of emptiness and into joy. Look at Jesus in our gospel lesson for today at the raising of Jairus' daughter. The naysayers laugh did you notice that? They laugh when he enters the room and says, the girl is only sleeping. They think him the fool. Well, the fool until a little girl stands up and starts eating. Then it is joy. 
joy beyond it. There is definitely a place and time for debate and conversation about difficult theological questions and times when our society travels down roads we disagree with. We shouldn't shrink back from them. Think about it. The Pharisees and Sadducees even tried to derail the message of Jesus himself by asking him the hot-button questions of the day, like, should we pay taxes to Caesar, or will there be marriage in heaven? But with those who are struggling to find hope, let's certainly begin, my friends, with an introduction to him who gives us life. And as they grow in their understanding of him, the Holy Spirit will certainly use his word of truth, law, and gospel to lead his people to know him better and to follow the will that he gives us there. In the end, may it be for all of us like it was for those who witnessed the raising of Jairus' daughter, that we experience the absolute joy that comes from being witnesses to his power, his love, his forgiveness, and his grace. Christ crucified. That's what it's all about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son.